So they're spread out throughout the, the, uh, the country. And then there's another couple dozen elsewhere, including Germany. And Germany actually decided to shut those down now, not, not 10 years from now, but they're shutting down these old boiling water reactors now. And then there's a bunch in Japan, too. So this, this containment design that was designed to contain this heat from that splitting didn't work. And um, the Japanese are having second thoughts. The German service are having second thoughts. And the American Nuclear Regulatory Commission says it's not a problem. It can't happen here. Um, and actually, there's no planned modifications on these containments as a result of Fukushima right now. Okay, so problem number one was when these things split, they give off a lot of heat. Engineers knew that. They built the containments, and the containments have failed three times out of three. Problem number two is that even when they stop giving off heat, they remain radioactive for for centuries. Um, this is an example of, of cesium-137. It's got a 30-year half-life. And, and a lot of people say, well, in, in 30 years, half is gone. In the next 30 years, the other half is gone. No, it doesn't work that way. In 30 years, half is gone. So if there was a million cesium particles, in 30 years, you're down to 500,000. In the next 30 years, half of those are gone. So you're down to 250,000. The next 30 years, Half of those are gone, you're down to 125,000. Well, what this means for Fukushima is that they've discovered radioactive straw at about 50 miles away from Fukushima that's at 600,000 disintegrations per second in the straw, in a pound of straw, not much straw. And so what that means, if you, if you keep that straw for a, mo a month, it's not going to decay away. A year, it's not going to decay away. 30 years, it'll go from 600,000 to 300,000. That's still not good. You really have to keep this stuff out of harm's way for 300 years before, it's completely, before it completely goes away. Uh, the concept is 10 half-lives. So if it's a 30-year half-life multiplied by 10, and after 10 of those... <laughs> divisions, it will get small enough that it's essentially impossible to, um, to measure. Now, iodine, which we heard about and we were concerned about in milk, had an eight-day half-life. So in 80 days, it was essentially gone from the milk. Uh, the issues are mainly cesium and strontium, which is a, um, strontium is a bone seeker, and cesium is a muscle seeker. And so they attack different parts of your body, and the plants give both of them off uh, extensively. So the the, um, if, if you remember your periodic chart, and I'm sure we all have the periodic chart burned in our head from some high school science teacher, right? Um, if you look at, uh, when you have a cramp, you're supposed to eat a banana because it has potassium. Well, potassium and cesium are, are right above each other in the periodic chart, so they mimic each other. So cesium goes to your muscles. After Chernobyl, the, there was a, um, a diagnosed new illness, if you will, called Chernobyl heart. Um, well, the heart's a muscle, and the, the radioactive cesium from Chernobyl went to the kids' hearts. There's a lot of heart damage after Chernobyl from this cesium deposition in the heart. Uh, strontium, if you remember, that's a little bit further out in a different column in the table. It's right under calcium. So it goes to your bones, and it damages your, your um, uh, marrow, which, of course, create white blood cells and can cause leukemia. So um, depending on the, the isotope, they have different organs which they, which they attack. Okay, um, let's flip and see where we're next. Okay, now there's one other problem that, I, uh, that, that doesn't revolve around the splitting of the, of the atom. A uranium-235 molecule can split and create the heat. Well, only about 5% of the molecules in that reactor are uranium-235. The others are uranium-238. Uranium-238 doesn't split. What it does is it absorbs a neutron. That's what that top line is. The, the, the blue N hitting the yellow U is uranium-238 being hit by a neutron. It goes through a couple of um, very quick changes and in the next day becomes plutonium. Now, plutonium is, so plutonium is not a radioactive daughter product. It didn't result from uranium being split. It resulted from uranium-238 picking up a neutron. And it basically becomes a bigger, newer molecule. Now, it's got a half-life of 24,000 years. And so 
in, if we, if we use this analogy again, a, a, a million in 24,000 years becomes a half a million in 24,000 years becomes 250,000 becomes 125,000, 75,000 years in the future. So we're creating a waste in plutonium that remains radioactive for 10 half-lives or a quarter of a million years. Now, this is a dollar bill. This is roughly a gram. It, uh, I, I teach um, physics and if people want to, you know, we all think in pounds because we're, we're, we're English, but uh, if you think in grams, the dollar bill is roughly a gram. A microgram, a millionth of this, if it's plutonium, is lethal, individually lethal. So one microgram of plutonium is, is lethal, and that's another problem. So we've got the relatively short-term problem. We only have to worry about the cesium stuff for the next 300 years. But then we've, got, then we've got this other problem of the plutonium that we have to worry about for a quarter of a million years. Um, the title, Into Eternity, is the name of a movie um, that's been out now for about six months. And it's a breathtaking movie made in Sweden that discusses the Swedes have nuclear power plants. And they've decided, OK, we're going to take care of this problem. We're going to build our own waste dump for us. We're not going to take care of the Germans or the French or the Americans. We're going to take care of our own, and we're going to build our own dump. And it talks about that process. This is the entryway into the, um, um, the Swedish dump. It's, it's in a granite formation on an island way, way up on the North Sea. And it's um, designed to have access for the next uh, century so they can put the fuel in. And then it's designed to be destroyed so nobody can get back in to, to, uh, to be damaged by the fuel. So the pyramids lasted 5,000 years. This has to last 45 times longer than the pyramids. We're talking about, you know, man started civilization 10,000 years ago, so we're talking about 24 times longer than, than uh, uh, people have been able to communicate using language. Uh, and w this facility has to remain intact to prevent that plutonium from getting in the environment. Well, it's interesting. This in movie, Into Eternity, talks about how do you put a sign on this building to warn people? And if you think about it, now, language, if you, you know, old English, gosh, I can't understand a thing from Beowulf, right? I don't even know what that was, old English, I'm sorry. I'm sure somebody here does. You know, it, so in a, less than a thousand years, we can't even understand what people said. And we're talking about putting a don't, uh, you know, keep out, danger keep out sign that's got to be understandable to people for the next quarter of a million years. So that was part of this, this, this movie, Into Eternity, is, is about that. So the, it's interesting, though. So the goal of this facility is to protect mankind from the plutonium. So we are generating plutonium in our lifetimes to watch Golden Girls on TV or Michael Jackson's funeral or, or whatever that's creating a waste that has to be, that has to be uh, guarded for the next quarter of a million years for that one hour of enjoyment watching your television screen. It's, a, it's an interesting thing to discuss. So this facility has, I thought this facility had one purpose. And a couple months ago, I was talking to a scientist. He says, no, he says, there's a second problem. The first problem I always thought, and the only problem I always thought, was to protect mankind from the plutonium. But there's another problem. We have to protect the plutonium from mankind. Now, you know, there's guys like Hitler that come along every now and then that want to, you know, destroy their neighbor. And if you know that a substance down there can make the greatest bomb in the world, what's to prevent a nefarious civilization a couple hundred years from now from drilling down to get it? So if we put the warning sign out to tell people stay away from here, the people, that protects the, us from the plutonium. But if we put that same sign out, it allows people to discover it and dig back down to make a weapon out of it in the future. So there's a real dichotomy here about should we maybe not even put a sign on this building, on this hunk of rock, and hope that over the next hundred years or a couple hundred years people will forget it's ever there and, and make it less likely. So we have to protect mankind from the plutonium, but we also have to protect the plutonium from mankind. The, the last thing I wanted to talk about is the, is the picture up here on the, um, on the top. That's a, a, a plutonium 
not atom, a piece of plutonium lodged in a lung of, a, of, a, of an ape. And the, um, the tracks that you see are individual alpha particles that are shooting out and damaging parts of the lung. And this gets back to that ICRP, ECRR debate. The, um, the ICRP, the International Council, the Bobby McFarlane Group, would say that, well, that energy gets averaged out over the whole lung. It's not a problem. And the, the, um, the, the other camp would say, no, just look at this radiograph. And it's not getting averaged out over a large mass of that lung. In fact, it's very concentrated in a very local, um, local location. Um, and I think that's it. All right. Thank you.